Good morning, everyone. Good morning, those of you online. My name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, part of our teaching team. I get to unpack our text this morning. Before I dive in, uh, I want us to think about subcultures, right? We talk about the culture all the time, but really the culture is a bunch of smaller subcultures. You're all a part of them, right? Some of them affect you positively, some of them affect you negatively. Uh, you know, one of the uh, subcultures that I, you know, here's a joke, you know, uh, how do you know someone is vegan? Uh, they tell you about it, you know. <laughs> how do you know someone's cross, does a CrossFit the same thing. They tell you about it. So I'm going to do that. So I do CrossFit. So anyway, those of you who are disappointed in that, that's all right. But I remember when I first started doing CrossFit, it was like me and a couple of my friends were getting, going to this CrossFit gym that was owned by like this X recon force multiplier, super green beret, whatever it is, like a lot of adjectives about how intense he was and good at eliminating the enemies, you know. And so he was all super intense, boot camp all the time. And we would go and We'd do all these pull-ups, and our hands would get all sweaty, and then our hands would rip, and like blood would go everywhere. And we'd be like, you know, slapping each other's blood over the bar, and then we'd think we're so cool, and we'd take pictures of it, and like post it on Instagram, you know, and like, look at us, we're intense. And like, in our little subculture, we thought we were super cool. And then I remember going and seeing people who were not in our little subculture, and they thought, you people are idiots. Like that's, it's self-harm. You people are stupid. And, and you just think, you know, it's like, how do these, so, so there's other subcultures, you know, and th- whether it's like a, a teacher and you kind of, there's like an inside lingo, a way of shorthand talking about stuff. And, you know, we don't have favorites, but you all have favorites. And that's kind of how it is. Um, there's so many of these things, you know, like thing about like golfing subculture, which is like the, you know, avoid your kids and wife subculture, you know, so <laughs> Then there's, but then, then there's like other subcultures and talk about folks who work in like the ER and get like exposed to trauma like every five minutes for all day long. And there's like this disassociative humor that develops because you can't keep feeling the pain. And so if you talk to nurses who work in the ER, like they tell jokes about stuff that everyone else would think like, you're a crazy person. You can't tell jokes about that. Um, or even like uh, folks in like law enforcement or firefighters, I talk to them and like it's, it's work for Christians who are in those type of subcultures to keep feeling broken over brokenness because you, you, just, you roll up on DOAs all the time and your heart gets, it's, it's tempting to just kind of callous up and just, and so there's like this difficulty of maintaining a soft heart that I talk to especially uh, firefighters and EMTs and whatnot. And, and one of the things about subcultures, I think, is, is, is the power they actually have over us, over you, over, over you and me. You know, this church is a subculture. There's subcultures within this subculture. Uh, but if you have never read the Bible before, and if you have never, uh, like, thought deeply about who Jesus was before, if you've never really kind of even been exposed to the message of the scriptures, if you started reading the book of John, so we're in John chapter 8, if you started reading at John chapter 1 and started reading and went left to right, you'd meet this subculture group called the Pharisees. And if you have no pre-knowledge about Pharisees, you would pick up pretty quickly that these people are a problem. They're opposed, like Jesus is saying he's God, he's doing miracles, and they're like standing at a distant, like, mm, do another one. And it's like, what's wrong with these people? Like, they're, they're clearly opposed to the main character of the story. But the question I want to wrestle with us this morning is, how did these people get to be that way? How did the Pharisees become the Pharisees? Because we have Pharisees in our, in, our, in, our, in our situation culturally on the left and on the right. This is the whole like, cancel culture phenomenon, right? Believe in this box or you're done. Think like us or you're out. The great irony I've seen just lately in the last couple of weeks is like uh, there was a woman who was an actress in uh, The Mandalorian, Disney, right? Um, which I just have to say, no offense to Star Wars people, she was cringy as an actress, I watched Mandalorian. Before I knew about the controversy, I'd watch it, and I was like, man, who cast her? You know, so, so anyway. But then, so, like, so she posts some, like, kind of right-wing stuff, conservative right-wing, depending on how positive or negative you want to, you know. She says some things on social media, and she gets fired. She gets canceled. Uh, you know, we're tolerant here. We don't speak like that. Canceled some irony. But then, but then the, the backlash 
was all these people saying, like, how dare they cancel someone? Cancel Disney. So we're just going to start canceling each other until everyone's canceled into oblivion. And it's like you have Pharisees on the left, Pharisees on the right. How did the Pharisees get to the way they are? You don't have to be religious to act like a Pharisee. You know, a heart that's hardened, that can't be taught, that can't learn, that can't be corrected by Jesus. A lot of the times Pharisees end up being religious people, but they don't, you tend to not become a Pharisee right away. You tend to become one over time. And so if you think about even like the way the Pharisees began, I want us to like feel some nervousness as Redemption Gateway about this. Because the Pharisees started off because you had these major tribes within Judaism in the first century before Jesus came. And you had the Essenes who were going, this culture is icky, and they went and lived in the desert. You know, like, and so the Pharisees were like, eh, we kind of want to love our neighbors, not just abandon them. So we're not going to be Essenes. Then you had the zealots who like carried around daggers and were like trying to off people who were uh, opposed to Judaism. And the Pharisees are like, eh, that seems a little bit not interested in that. Maybe let's try to go like the way of peace. Then you had the Sadducees, other Jews. And their, their kind of deal was selling out on their convictions in order to be accepted by the Roman culture. So they kind of went soft on their convictions. And so the Pharisees are kind of trying to not be any of those three people. And they're going, we want to stand firm to God's word and stand firm to his, what he teaches in Scripture. And we want to be uh, people who stand for what we know is true. But then eventually what happens is they become these people with hard hearts who can't be taught by God, who can't be corrected, who exclude people trying to enter in, who keep people at arm's distance. And when God himself shows up, they're like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. And so I'm not saying that we have this huge problem as Redemption Gateway called we're becoming Pharisees, but I am saying that the default mode of the human heart is to drift into being like a Pharisee. Christian, non-Christian, moral, immoral, old, young. We tend, it, you can see this like on coronavirus stuff, you know, I've, this is kind of the way, I, like, I think rightly about everything Anyone who does more than me is reckless, and anyone who does less than me is afraid. <laughs> but if anyone does exactly what I do, then they're thinking clearly that we, the judgment goes left and right all over the place. And so the default mode of becoming a Pharisee. And so I want us as Redemption Gateway as a church to kind of feel a level of nervousness about the temptation to drift into becoming like Pharisees. And so that's our big idea this morning, is that becoming a Pharisee is natural. It's totally natural. At the end of this text, Jesus says, I always do things that are pleasing to him, pleasing to the Father. But if we really want to be people who are pleasing to God, which the Pharisees are not, that's actually supernatural. And so I want every person in this room, just whether you're in this room watching online, to realize that your tendency is to drift into judgmental Phariseeism. And if we don't actively recognize that we're tempted to do that, we will become that. So let me pray, and then we're going to look at the values of the Pharisee and how the Pharisees create Pharisees. So let me pray. Jesus, I pray that you open our ears, soften our hearts, help us see what you have for us in this text. Amen. All right, so Pharisee value number one is ritual over reality. That's how the Pharisees got to be the way they are. So Jesus, in this story, um, he is at the festival of booths. So there's this big, major, week-long festival that the Jews would have that would last about a full week. And this festival was established to primarily celebrate what God had done in freeing them from slavery and getting them through the wilderness, and then also to celebrate in anticipation of what God was going to do later. And so they're on the last night of the Feast of Booths, the festival of booths. Now this was the, and it's called booths, uh, you know, it's like they build these little structures and they hang out outside, remembering when God took them through the wilderness. Through this last day of the seven-day feast, which sounds pretty great, but even then, like the people in the first century, especially like a handful of Jewish scholars or, or people who were writing, you know, 2,000-something years ago, they would say things like this, you have not lived until you have seen with your own eyes the festival of lights on the last night of the festival of booths. 
And so like this was like the, the final Super Bowl moment out in the desert. They're lighting things up. It's kind of fire. Like I think about like when I hear folks in their 20-somethings, kind of like they go to Burning Man for the first time and they come back, thing like, I understand the world totally differently now. Like, you have not lived till you've gone to Burning Man. Or folks who are a little bit older who are like, I was at Woodstock. You know, I know what it was like. Whatever. It's like, it's like the thing, the event that makes you feel like I find. And so these Jews, for them, that was the festival of booze. And the last night, they would burn a tremendous amount of wood with all these lights and would light it up. And they talked about it like every square inch of darkness in the city was lit up by the lights that were on display. And they would recognize that these, these lights that were on display was not just a good time for sake of a good time, but it was meant to be a picture of reality, that the sign pointed past itself to the reality, that the ritual was meant to lead you into reality. And so they would light it all up, and it was fantastic. And one of the things they even said was that the most pious of all Jews would dance and party all through the night. You're like, man, where's that in our religion? You know, <laughs> where is that? You know, and so the Jews are celebrating what God had done and they're, they're enjoying what God has done. They're enjoying his current blessings and they're looking forward to his future blessings. And so, and then kind of like the climax of the whole evening outside of the treasury, which is where Jesus is, is they would read these texts, a couple of them. I want to read a couple of these texts. So these are Jews, they'd read this text. They'd say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine his face on you and be gracious to you. The Lord raise his face to you and establish peace for you, that the face of God was shining, that the lights of these things were burning were meant to be a picture to us of the way that God's face shines, it warms, it lights up. Even just yesterday, I was sitting in the backyard at a friend's house, and we're kind of in that part of like Arizona weather where it's like if you're in the shade in a shirt and t- shorts, you're like cold, but if you're in the sun, it's like just right. And so we we're sitting in a circle talking, and the sh- sun was going down, and I kept getting like a little bit into the shade and then I'd get cold and I'd move my chair into the sun. But like feeling like the, the moment that when you're a little cold and the Arizona warmth kind of just thaws you out, just like this is the face of the Lord shines. There's a coldness, a darkness. And when you're really experiencing the presence of God, it's the face shining on you. He sees you, he lights you up. So much of our hyper-visual cultural moment that I think oppresses a lot of us, especially like with our, the Instagram visualization of things, is there's this deep desire that to, I must be seen, I must be seen as beautiful, I must be seen as valuable, and I will do what it takes to get the content that makes people's eyes land on me with the way that I want them to land. And so maybe if you're of a, a slightly older generation, it's less Instagram, but it's resume. I just want to be seen and approved and loved and seen as beautiful. And so, so much of our pathologies and our disorders as a society is we're trying to get the eyes of the right people on us with the right smile. And this is what Numbers is talking about, is what all of us really want is something that only God can give, and that is that his face would shine, his smile would be on us. So many of the different ways we sin and we try to prove ourselves and try that we try to earn, we're trying to earn the eyes of the right people. And God is the one person for, you, you cannot earn his eyes. His face shines and it's on you. And the picture of this festival ceremony was meant to be a picture to the Jews of God sees us. Even though we're being oppressed in Roman culture, God still sees us. Even though we're not yet in the promised land, God sees us. Even though he's not doing exactly what we want when we want him to do it, he sees us. And they'd also read these other two texts. One of them is um, from Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light, God most high, Yahweh, the King of Israel, the King of the Jews, the one who created the universe, the one who's going to recreate the universe, the one who's bringing us and ruling over history. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God is light. His word is light. And Jesus, after these ceremony verses are read, Jesus stands up in this context, and it's in this context, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's saying, I'm God. I'm the word of God. I'm the one whose eyes warm up your cold skin. I'm the one whose eyes melt your hard heart. I'm the one whose eyes you cannot earn, but I give my approval freely because of my grace. And the Jews are just annoyed. You're interrupting my ceremony. We do rituals. 
The whole point of the ritual was to introduce you to the real, and the real is there, and they were too preoccupied with the ritual to even see the real. They stand at a distance and judge and try to put Jesus in a box and figure him out. And I think we do the same thing a lot of times at Redemption Gateway. That we're really interested in songs and sermons. And we're not all that interested in the spirit of God moving among us, animating us, leading us, guiding us, changing us, convicting us, encouraging us, and immobilizing us or mobilizing us into what he's calling us to do. That the point of this Sunday gathering is not how are the songs, how is the sermon. The question is what is the spirit doing in our midst and making us a healthy family that can welcome people in and love them well so that we can go out and be loving to our neighbors. I hope that when we walk out of here as Gateway, we're not going, how'd the band do? Thumbs up, seven out of 10, four stars. That's consumer language. That belongs at Burger King. Have it your way. <laughs> I don't want us to get caught up in rituals. And we have rituals. They're just not as obvious as the Jewish ones. The real thing, God is present. He's real. We're not just here to just kind of maintain some type of thin, veiled, moral vision. That's not what the goal. We think God is real. We think he's among us, and he's shaping us. And so I hope we walk in here not prepared to just critically evaluate songs and sermons, but to ask the Spirit, do something in my heart and mind this week that will empower me to be who you're calling me to be the rest of the week. Let's never put ritual over reality. Pharisee value number two is tribe over truth. Tribe over truth. One of the things we've seen here is uh, the Jews aren't really actually concerned with the truth. They're interested in protecting their tribe. And they're going to protect their tribe by exploiting loopholes and coming up with smokescreen excuses on why they don't want to follow Jesus. They keep kind of acting like they're interested in truth, but in reality they're interested in making sure that Jesus doesn't shake up their status quo. Again and again and again, the Pharisees come up with another reason to not believe. I would believe, but in this text it goes like this. The Pharisees say, hmm, verse 13, so you're bearing witness about yourself, therefore your testimony is not true. Aha, you can't testify about yourself. That's cheating. We don't have to listen to you. And if I was Jesus at this point in time, which good for all of you, I'm not, I would say, get your head out of your, the clouds and <laughs> listen to what I'm saying to you. You're coming up with excuse after excuse after excuse. It's ridiculous. And Jesus ends up saying, you think I bear witness about myself? What have you been seeing these past couple of months? That Jesus has turned water into wine. Jesus has fed the 5,000. Jesus has healed the deceased, Jesus has healed cripples, and all that they're finding do is they're finding reasons to not believe. And here comes another one. And Jesus, basically what his answer is, is like, you're asking me if I bear witness about myself? These miracles I've been doing have been the Father bearing witness about my identity. The reason I'm doing these miracles is not just for a show and a good time. I'm doing these miracles so that you will see that the Father is proving to you that I am his son. He is bearing witness about me. In your law, it's written, the testimony of two people is true. I'm the one who bears witness about myself. This is verse 18. And the Father who sent me also bears witness about me. He's validating my word and testimony. And they say, where's your father? They're more concerned about who his daddy is and where he's from. They're trying to dismiss him for being from Galilee earlier. They're trying to write him off from being from Nazareth. They're trying to write him off based on who his dad is. Isn't your dad that other guy? It's smokescreen. I think a lot of the times that God is working in our heart, mind, soul, it's painful because we're being dismantled. He's correcting us. He's changing us. And it's pretty natural. Again, it's natural to become a Pharisee. It's natural to want to find reasons to not have a soft heart and to be teachable. Because change is pain. There's no change without pain. Tribe over truth. The Pharisees have defined themselves in opposition to the other Jewish tribes. They're no longer being defined as the people who are waiting for the Messiah to come. They're being defined as the people who are better Jews than those other Jews. And if Jesus comes and corrects us, that means maybe we're not better than those other Jews to the degree that we thought we were. We've got to protect our market niche Make sure we have the corner on what's going on around here. I just got to say, that's a temptation for us too. 
to try to define ourselves in ways that we're different than the other followers of Jesus. I come back to the Apostles' Creed, the, the baseline confession that there is one holy universal church, one holy apostolic universal church, that we are part of, we're brothers and sisters in Christ with Christians all over the globe, all throughout history, all over our region, all over our city, and we're all the body of Christ. And we'll become like Pharisees if we keep trying to define ourselves. And, and I'm tempted to do that. Maybe you're not as tempted as I am to try to just differentiate, well, like, you need to meet someone, oh, I go to this church, like, oh, well, they're different than us because, like, you know, this reason, that reason, that. And I think it's ugly. It's being like a Pharisee. It's gross. I don't want to do that. I'm tempted to do that. And I don't want to be a redemption gateway to be a place where we kind of are going, well, here's our strengths and weaknesses compared to other churches' strengths and weaknesses. That's just, what are we even doing here? We're not trying to carve out a market. We're trying to be a faithful family who helps people meet and know and love Jesus. We're trying to birth and strengthen healthy disciples. Tribe over truth. It's temptation. It pulls us. We really want to be the right ones. But I think part of the whole point of this story that we see in the scriptures is that we are never the right ones. And that's why we need grace. Which brings us to their third one. Uh, Pharisee value number three is prejudice over justice. Verse 15, John 8, verse 15. Jesus telling the Jews, you judge according to the flesh. Where are you from? Who's your daddy? How moral are you? How immoral are you? Things you can see on the surface. Ways that you can assess and notice. Reasons to exclude. You know, prejudice is not new. One of the things that's really annoying to me about conversations nationally is acting like we just discovered people were prejudiced for the first time. And I don't want to, for a minute, not lament prejudice where it exists, but I do think our arrogance in believing, like, we made this up a couple hundred years ago in the United States is kind of stupid. But it goes up, down, every direction, what people look like, what people talk like, their dialect, their clothes. You, th- you see someone, and you can think, you, you know, I see someone wearing a cowboy's jersey, and I'm like, I already know. But in much more serious ways than that, we, we think we see we we pin people up, you know. I feel like one of the one of like the my kind of insecurities that I have to work through is like I get really nervous about telling people I'm a pastor when I meet them places because I feel like they're gonna fill in the blank on a whole bunch of stuff that I don't want them to fill in the blank on. Maybe you're in a profession like that too. I've talked to folks, especially law enforcement officers, who are like I honestly want to tell all my neighbors I'm a law, enfor- I'm a law enforcement officer because they're going to assume, bang, 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 you know. And so it, it goes so many directions. For the Jews, it was. There was, there was a real measure of ethnic superiority. You're not like us. You can't be a part of us. And Jesus is saying, even like, not even ethnic, but moral, Right? There was a, there's a reality that you know, the, the, the Greeks around the Pharisees kind of lived this like, like orgiastic, chronic pursuit of pleasure. That was like the, the main thing that they lived in. And so the Jews are kind of like, well, we just tend to sleep with our spouses. So, so there was an element of moral superiority or at least like a sense like they're kind of... Li- so it'd be easy for them to be smug morally. And Jesus is looking at them saying like, you don't even have a shot. One of the things he says is the Pharisees really think that they're people who are pleasing to God. And Jesus is getting at his point in verse 29 is, I do what's pleasing to God. You do not. Compared to Jesus, the Pharisees have no reason to boast morally. They can compare themselves to their neighbors and think, I'm doing pretty good because I'm more moral than my neighbor. And Jesus is going, your scale's all out of whack. Stop comparing yourself to other fallen sinful humans and you start comparing yourself to me and you realize that you have a problem. I am the one who pleases God. 
And so the Jews would have heard this, the Pharisees would have heard this and been like, wait a minute, I thought we were the ones who pleased God. And he's offensive to him. And so rather than nitpicking their various sins, whether they're sins of the heart, judge, judgment, you know, smug, whatever it is, he looks at them, and this is something that would be scary to hear Jesus. Like, imagine Jesus saying this to you. This is verse 25. So they said to him, who are you? As though like he hadn't been doing miracles and saying who he was for the last six, seven chapters. Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. This is scary. I have much to say about you. <sighs> Jesus has much to say about you, too. He has much to say about me. I have much to say about you. And much to judge. And it's not all good. But, like, okay, okay, changing directions. I have much to say about you, much to judge. But, what Jesus is getting at in this text is there's a primary judgment, the most important judgment, the preeminent assessment. And this is the true justice, is that people have broken God's law, that people think they know God and they don't. These people who are oppressing people by excluding them and not including them in what God is doing. And Jesus looks at them and says, you, this is verse 21, I'm going away and you'll seek me. You will die in your sin. He's telling this to the religious leaders who think that they certainly know God. And he looks them straight in the eye and says, you will die in your sin. He doesn't speak that directly and harshly to the people who don't think they know God. He speaks that directly and harshly to the people who are convinced they know God. Here's what he says in verse 24. is I told you that you die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He tells the people who are convinced they know the Father, you don't know the Father. He tells people, you're convinced you know God, you don't know God. And he tells them, unless you believe that I am the Son of God, the one who took on flesh to walk on this earth to love and serve and die for your sins, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. And he predicts the future on these Pharisees and says, you're going to die in your sins. You know why? Because your heart is so hard you can't be corrected by God. This is not a threat he's making to people who don't go to church down our street. This is a threat he's making that I hope Weezer M. should get would realize that we are prone to become Pharisees. That we assume because of someone's sexual history or sexual current behaviors, we assume because of someone's income or non-income, because of the way someone speaks or doesn't, doesn't speak, because of their theology or lack of theology, because of their accuracy and inaccuracy, we prejudge people all the time. We give them a trial without a trial. We assume we fill in the blanks. But Jesus says, I do not judge according to the flesh, but I judge from God's perspective. And in God's perspective, I'm the only one who pleases the Father. But you can be pleasing to the Lord if you trust in me. If you see my eyes on you and receive it as grace. And I want us as Redemption Gateway to, to see that, to sense that, to believe that God's eyes are on us. And if that in a minute creates us this judgmental, smug, holier than thou, basically everyone I know who doesn't go to church, there's some story of I felt judged. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But honestly, the more I know people, probably they were. We've judged people at this church. I've judged people at this church. It's natural. It doesn't mean it's good. And if we don't actively, purposefully try to work against the natural bent of the human heart, which is to judge and assume and assign and label and distance, we will become like the Pharisees. Nobody signs up to become like the Pharisees. They sign up because they love Jesus and they see that Jesus loves them. But over time, the heart gets hard, the calluses develop, becomes them and their agenda and those people and over there. And I just pray it'll never be like that for our church. That this is justice. We must perfectly obey the Father, period. Bad news, nobody ever does that. Good news, Jesus dies for our sin and loves us anyway. And so now we can be pleasing to the Father. That's justice. That the wrath of God is no more because Jesus took our place. So rather than getting caught up in these petty, prejudiced, tribe, sub-community stuff, we can be committed to Christ. Recognizing that he is our definer, that he is our defender, that his eyes 
are on us. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you will continue to soften our hearts, continue to open our ears. I pray for folks who have heard this a thousand times, for people who this is the first time they've heard it, that you would encourage all of us, that we would feel and sense the need of the need to prove ourselves, that we'd feel that drip away, that in its place we'd see um, the warmth of God Most High loving us as we are. In the name of your Son we pray, amen.